Good day, and thank you all so very much for coming back and being a part of Black Futures 2023. This is Dejan Sneed here, founder of Subsume Media here in Atlanta, Georgia. Subsume's intersection of creativity, technology, and community, where we look to be a value add to the stories of tomorrow by making sure everyone stays included today. And with that, we are coming to a final run of amazing day two here with Black Futures 2023. But we're always looking at how can we find our spaces and places that we can not only survive, but thrive creatively. And so the idea of gaming and gameplay is something that pretty much everyone has some purview within their lives. And so the idea of looking at the future of gameplay, particularly from an inclusive lens, uh, we wanted to bring in one of the uh, a renowned world expert and or all around cool kid to come around and talk to us about how do we find our space in the future of gameplay? With so many components of that, I'm just going to go ahead and ask you to stage uh, Miss Tanya DePas and uh, from I Need Diverse Games and so many other points of our great geek culture. And it's just going to be a privilege for us to have this as a closing component of Day 2 for Black Futures. So with that, we'll go ahead and bring and uh, and then uh, bring Tanya to the stage. Thank you so very much. Good day, hey. good day. Well, hello, hello. Well. Pleasure. No, oh, absolutely. And thank you so much. I, um, you know, get a, a chance now to um, meander with you here uh, <laughs> in a great way about the future of gameplay. And again, thank you so very much for, for coming in and sharing some time here with us. So I'd love, of course, to uh, allow you the opportunity to introduce yourself and uh, your many accomplishments and, and points of connection so that we can learn to, you know, how we best can uh, continue the conversation from there. Uh, hi, everybody. My name is Tanya, uh, also known everywhere online as Cypher of Tear. Uh, thank you for the intro and for inviting me to come and hang out with you. Because, hey, I get to come and talk about games with other Black folks. I'm in. <laughs> um, you know, I, I do a lot on the internet. A lot of people know me for I Need Diverse Games, but I also do TTRPG development, creating along with an amazing cast and crew of developers um, into the Motherlands, which is an Afrofuturist sci-fi RPG, which will be out, knock on wood, this year, as soon as we find a new uh, publisher. I do streaming, I do diversity consulting, I do a little bit of everything, and I often yell on the internet. Fantastic, and, and even in, in all those points, I'm sure we're, we're not giving you enough credit, and we, but we thank you for being here. So the idea, and likewise, uh, a chance to geek out and talk games, um, I'm all in as well. So to that component, as, as you alluded, gaming means so much more than just the games that we think of and, and each individual component, right? The idea of digital games or traditional games we think of like Monopoly or the other components. And then, of course, mm -hmm. we have, you know, more intricate, uh, intricate games uh, that leave, start with tabletop, such as Dungeons and Dragons go all the way into things like Mech Warrior and just more involved and what we call advanced gameplay from there. You know, where where for you had was where did this all start? Uh I'm I'm one of those people I'm about to tell on myself and my age. Uh I remember the Atari 2600, Commodore, you know, the the Pong, um, you know, going to arcades and lining up quarters. Those don't seem to exist anymore. Um, and also Dungeon Dragons, you know, I'm, I'm slightly older than the game itself. And I, I don't know if you dealt with this, but I dealt with the satanic panic at home. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I've been, been playing games since, since Pong and that one stick with the fake wood grain was a thing. <laughs> oh, absolutely. No, I'm, I'm well initiated. And likewise in that, in that cool kids age bracket where I can recall, uh, the the absolute horror by which it was to bring a, a Dungeons and Dragons book home, right? And, yep. uh, and the idea of what that meant, particularly, and to speak to my experience, but again, would be curious to yours is, you know, not finding uh, culturally a lot of folks finding uh, that same value or valuation in that space, right? So just please, yeah. thank you. Sorry. Uh, no, I'm just trying to think of how, how politely can I say this? Cause I know what my mother <laughs> used to say to me. Um, basically I was told that D and D gaming geek stuff, that's all things white folks do. It's not things quote unquote we do. Mm -hmm. So it was hard to one, just exist in that space because there were not a lot of us. There's still not a lot of us, at least that are very visible, but there's also the component of the other black folks who said that that's not a thing we do. 
And it's like, why are you trying to be white? Why are you trying to do this? So there's that both internal, that's not a thing we do, but also there's the external. When you don't see people like yourself in the space, you wonder, do you really belong there? Because there's so many people that we grew up with, and I, I still talk to, that are like, you know, I would have never thought you could even make a living playing D&D or writing for it. And so it's it's been kind of a struggle on both sides of it of, now I found a lot more black people. I found a lot more people of color. Um, you know, I'm I'm very lucky to be on a and D show that is all people of color, mostly black cast, and to find other people in that space. But it's just been it's been wild watching things change, and going from being the only black person in the room, the only woman in the room, the only queer person in the room, to actually being surrounded by your people. Oh, absolutely. And I think there's a, a myriad of, of changes and, and possibilities happen to your point from when we're talking about satanic panic to mm -hmm. going to Target and buying a starter D&D &D set. Right. Yep. And the idea is yep. like that the accessibility means that there's been so many spaces and places of inclusion that at least in some point have been addressed, whether or not they've been appropriately addressed, I'm sure as part of this conversation. But the idea of where where it started, as we recall it, to where it is now, there seems that it is it's definitely something has happened and something is a shift. And so what's your take on the I'll say the contemporary culture or popular culture of of diverse gameplay, at least in the way that we intake it? It's it's like climbing a glacier. You know how you those. Um, like when you work in the office and you always see just the tip of the iceberg on like uh, org charts and things like that, or even those, this is what you see. This is what's going on under the surface. Mm -hmm. It, I feel like gaming has got to that. Cause when I started this, it was all a happy accident. It was not on purpose. Mm -hmm. um, and so now we are seeing people being more vocal about needing inclusion and diversity. When I do get a gig doing DEI work, people are coming to me at day one when the project is still under a code name and that's all it is you got to sign the nda just to talk to somebody versus some jobs where they would bring me in but it was clear they just wanted the rubber stamp of we're not racist there was no way to fix anything there was no way to change anything um and contemporary wise we still have ways to go because look at how people still act when there's a black protagonist look at the reaction um, for spoken has gotten with the caveat of we know no black people wrote the character of Fred, but there's also the game writing issue of sometimes the game writing happens and then the game has to fit around the words or vice versa. The word, the game happens and words have to be crammed in to make it work. So without any of us knowing the back end of that and, you know, acknowledging that there were no black people in the writer's room, the game has still been panned ridiculously because we've got a black female lead. Um, I even was playing it earlier today and someone came in of all things to complain about was the graphics. It's like, mm -hmm. I'm sorry, have you not seen the graphics of this game? Of all the things you're going to complain about, but they probably were winding up to complain about the character at that point. So we're, we're, we've slowly like got out of the water and we're on the, getting to the tip of the iceberg, but we're not there yet. I think it's going to be at least another five to 10 years before we get to a, a place where we can announce a game with a black lead. We can announce something like Motherlands and not have people make assumptions about the game because uh, we dealt with so much racism and foolishness just announcing the show before we even decided to do a Kickstarter and make the game itself. Yes, I would say that's uh, it's, I would say that's a tragedy, of course, to the idea of, of not even being able to build where we are now with all the advancement that we see in the gameplay space. Uh, just understanding that a black female protagonist, you know, be it a, a fantastic RPG player or a mermaid underwater, right, will cause civic unrest in some parts of this world. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think that, you know, we, Obviously, the gaming as as it is to me is a solution space, right? Where we figure it out in gaming, I think we see that it can translate and be comprehended in, in other components. But now we'd love to kind of talk more about, um, I guess we'll get to the idea of, since you mentioned it, of Motherlands RPG, because I do want to cover that kind of in breadth of how that development, 
how that ideation and, and kind of those components are. Do you see the opportunity in building your own types of games? Of course, we're talking about now like for, for spoken and other things like D&D. These are properties and spaces that are already built out and exist. So the idea of gameplay and being able to design and develop obviously is a space in your expertise as well. So then knowing and, and addressing the problems that we see right now, then how did Motherlands as a as an idea come to be? So Motherlands itself uh, came about through a collaboration with Twitch. So the, the stream show happened first. And, you know, I was I was pitching some things to Twitch. And, of course, I pitched some d and I pitched some other stuff. And they said, well, the market's saturated with D&D. What about something else? And I tried to pitch Star Trek, but I guess there were licensing things going on. And they're like, eh, let's not touch that. Could be weird. Um, so what about telling your own story? And I was like, okay, I guess. <laughs> um <laughs> And, you know, along with B. Dave Walters, we sat down and, and came up with a few ideas, decided what would work. And then we did a like one of those calendar things of if we have to produce 12 episodes by the end of the calendar year, oh, we need to start very soon. So we came up with our idea, um, you know, shout out to B. Dave, because he he with his brain and, and ways of looking at things helped me because I had a really weird and whack idea to start with. And, you know, we, we pitched the idea, which was, it's a whole new world populated by people that would be related to Mansa Musa, who actually sent out a expedition that never made it to the Americas. That is a historical fact, but it's not where our story starts. That expedition wound up on this planet, and this is all, like, out of the box. Everyone has contributed to create the world of Utoa and the, the solar system it exists in. And, you know, we did well. Twitch liked us enough to, to fund three more seasons. But between the, the first and second season, people were like, I would love to play this. And we're like, oh, okay. And so we decided, let's make a game. Why not? If we kickstart it and we get the money, cool. And if we don't, well, we tried. And uh, the Kickstarter did very well to the point where I kind of freaked out because it funded in 90 minutes. Um, mm. And then by the time we were done, we were about 720% over our goal. Mm -hmm. And um, we've been working on the game. It's it's almost done because, as you know, there's roadblocks because making your own mechanics is hard. Um, and so we had an unfortunate issue with our publisher. They did drop the ball and drop us. So we are now seeking another publisher. And once that's settled... Knock on wood, the book, at least the PDF, can be in people's hands by the end of the year and um, all the other goodies that people pledge for on the Kickstarter. Because if we'd been able to use Cortex, it probably would be done by now. But that that deal was not going to be beneficial for anybody mm. except them. So Fair. No, then again, uh, you know, it was uh, uh, an appreciative backer and again, just fan fan of the premise. Absolutely excited to and see you in its time and, and and glad to see so i do want to take one step back as we as we may i know we're initiated in this sense of what it in some sense is what it takes to make a a tabletop rpg mm -hmm. Can you go over some of the roles and responsibilities that for your core team around motherlands that that we can kind of expound upon for those in our audience that may not know kind of what are some roles in creating a role-playing game or tabletop rpg Oh boy. Uh, so, and keep in mind, we learned a lot of this on, at least I learned a lot of this on the fly. Sure. Um, but you need a creative director, which is me. Uh, we have a lead developer, which is, which is B Dave. And he kind of corrals developers and the writers. We have about 15 writers. Um, we had an art director, uh, Vanessa, who then went out and got artists and she managed the whole art process, you know, got people samples, did everything else, all the hiring for that. And then um, we've got someone who's going to do layout and we have someone who did maps. We actually found a, uh, Aaron Radney who does cartography, which I didn't think we were able to get a black person to do cartography because I was going to sound weird. And all the time I've been doing D&D &D and other stuff, I've not found a person of color who did maps. Mm. So he did that. And we've got a few other artists that are doing our cover and... Um, so there's artists, there's lead artists, um, lead artist slash art director, 
lead developer, writer. We don't like differentiate between senior, junior, like you all are writing, just, just write. Um, cartographer and then um, layout and design. Oh, great. And, and thank you for that clarification. And, and I wanted to kind of expound on that because again, we're talking about gameplay. A lot of these same roles are the same ones that we look at in video games. So the idea of, of creative director, art director, uh, narrative writer, also being able to game mechanics and design. A lot of that's synonymous across gaming just in some. So again, where I felt like you're the, again, the right person to talk about where when we're thinking about gameplay, whether or not it's digital or whether it's physical or something in between, that a lot of those same roles are there. But that also means those same roles may have opportunities in finding inclusive people to fill them or also be appreciative of those cultures that they may try to expound upon. Yeah, and one role that I forgot was our mechanics because once we decided not to go with Cortex, we need someone to make the game work because that's the thing, no matter whether it's a video game or tabletop or a board game, you can have the setting and you can you know lay whatever you want on top of the mechanics, but you need a way for the game to work and be fun, especially with a tabletop to not have power creep, scope creep of either I'm so weak early on in the beginning anything can kill my character to at level 20 i'm a demigod and nothing can touch me and you basically have to you know bring in superman to to have an equitable fight so there's so many things in which it's hard to to balance all of that and that's what a lot of people i think don't understand because you know they're used to the way the way things are done and they don't think about the way things should be done or things can change. Hmm. That's fair. And and I think that change really, again, kind of gets back to the crux of the opportunities that we may see in some spaces. Um, that, But again, that for your team, particularly with Motherlands, and I know of your work, are champion to clarify and and uh, and advance as best as, as possible. So with that, it always... And I kind of say it just as a fan and as a person in the space, it always seems to strike me odd that, you know, we can imagine dragons and all these other fantastic creatures, but we cannot imagine black people in spaces of equality in fantastic spaces. Do you think that, I don't know why that is. And I really just say that to say, it seems like, again, the way that tabletop RPGs and gaming in general comes up with narratives it seems mm -hmm. that it's based off of, of course, you know, Eurocentric folklore, which a lot of times ends up being, you know, uh, some root or derivative of Arthurian, of Arthurian legend, or again, um, you know, tradition, Greek, Roman God, and um, and pantheon yeah. spaces like that, or as we may see in some movies, like a reimagined space of, let's say, like Comet, Kemetic Egypt, right? That may or may not be as culturally accurate as some may protect, but again, maybe from a you know, English and you know, Oxford interpretation of what of what of what you, um, Egypt might have been seems to be what makes it the screen, what makes it the games, what makes it to popular culture. Now, with that, is there any space of of kind of consideration that you've seen again as a consultant that that at least is some point of the narrative or do you see in a majority of, of policy seems to be that more of the same is still good so in terms of like arthurian legend and things like that the problem with with that stance and not that you're taking it but the way in which g game developers excuse lack of diversity there were black people in those times you know the moors existed uh i can never it's the cloisters in new york which is a castle and museum, there's actually artwork in the story of a black knight. And I'm not remembering his name, but we existed in those times. You know, black people just didn't appear a whole cloth out of slavery, but that's how a lot of people want to treat it because they've never read a history book or we don't get that history because, well, to the victor go the spoils. We don't learn about that because I didn't know about this knight until I was in New York at the cloisters myself. Mm -hmm. Um, I think there are people working on the inside of studios to make it better. Not all studios. Because a project that I'm hopefully going to onboard on soon, they are thinking about their protagonist and antagonist 
and wanting to do it right and making sure that while they they create an antagonist that could be seen as oh you're just making x into a antagonist or a villain because that's super easy they're trying to make sure that it's done with care they're making sure that it's done well so anyone who tries to go but historical accuracy they are just being lazy i'm i'm just going to say it it's some it's some straight up lazy racism when you can have a scottish accent dwarf or I don't know, a guy who's a mutant and white hair and yellow cat eyes, but you can't imagine anybody brown. Um, and yes, I'm talking about The Witcher. I'm just, I was trying to be subtle, but why be subtle? Um, you know, we, we do hear about the brown skin people in The Witcher universe, but not until you do some DLC. And if you don't do this DLC, you never learn about them and you, and you see them and then they're caricatures. They're not even done well. So... There are some studios which are doing things well, but they're few and far between. And then they don't talk about it because a lot of times if they bring in a consultant early or they hire, a lot of times you're in our NDA, you can't say anything until the game is out. And sometimes you're brought in before things are even announced and it's still under a code name. So, you know, I will, I will give credit where credit is due. And I know people have problems with Ubisoft, but all the times I've worked with them, they were doing the right thing early. And they're considering that. Uh, but when you get things like Crusader Kings and, you know, where it's still like all white people in Europe, we existed back then. We were knights and things like that. Um, so at that point, I was just, I'm just going to call it what it is. It's lazy racism. If you can imagine all this other stuff, but not people of color. I agree. I mean, I think that's just really to the crux of, of what it is. It, mm -hmm. It's just it's it is that. So um, the idea of being able to build more spaces that are spaces of inclusion. And again, I want to make sure, of course, as we speak about Black Futures Month and Black and inclusion in this space, you know, the narrative is not just of color, right? We we want it to be of uh, you know of of self determination, you know, and all the mm -hmm. other myriads of spaces, whether that's neurodiversity. Uh, whether in queer positivity as well as accessibility and use of uh, of tools and materials that for game interactivity. So we'll make sure we clarify that as component because mm -hmm. all of those encompass yeah, blackness yeah. and should be appreciated, you know, for what they are. Um, yeah. But at the same time, you know, so how do we start building on that, you know, building that, building that table and not the table just of inclusion, but of equitable space. <laughs> where our stories seem to, I don't seem to, our stories are inherently valued by, uh, by the gaming community in some. Um, so in terms of equity, it's getting people to the table and not just saying here's some wood, go build your own. Because you know, and I know that when you build your own table, everybody that didn't want you to have a seat at the big table, it's already there and overcrowded. They also want to take a spot at the new table that you're building. So, the, the long short of it is, is money because uh, I don't know if you've ever been um, the game developer conference, GDC. It's like the thing to go to no matter your level in the industry. And it costs two grand just to get a badge for the week. Not many people got two grand before you've booked a flight, hotel, anything like that to go to GDC. Um, and a lot of times studios won't send you if you're not speaking so if depending on the money you're making you may not be able to afford it even though you're in the industry and a lot of times programs that are supposed to help people are a one-time only deal like they'll help you get to gdc once or they'll help you get to like indicate once or they'll do a code camp the equity needs to be we've built a table we've annexed the table that exists we've given you a spot and we're going to help you. And we're not just going to go, here's our diversity hire. Good luck. Because so many people wind up being the only person of color in the studio. They wind up being the only out queer person, the only femme person, the only trans person open. I shouldn't say openly, but visibly disabled. And then they become the, you know, other duties as a sign becomes they're now the in-house diversity person when it's not what they signed up for. So it's supporting people. It's helping them you know, in, increase their skills, improve their skills, become seniors, become leads. Um, 
or somebody says, I'm going to make my own studio, basically helping them with the funding, helping them with, with it so they succeed. Because too many times we hear, go build your own, go do your own thing. But then we do, as I'm sure you know, then it's not like that. What? Why are you discriminating? Where, where are the white people? And it's like, y'all got every studio under the sun. Let me have this small thing. And support each other. And, and this is going to probably get me in trouble with some people, depending on who's watching. Um, we need to stop the crab in a barrel mentality. Because too many people act as if, let's say you're out here, you're doing awesome things, you're on the come up, you're you're doing this event. And if I'm sitting over here being a hater, what does that do for anyone but make me bitter and doesn't help uplift what you're doing? Because your success and other black people's success does not take away from what you're doing. And I'm saying you, not you personally, for anyone who's watching. Um, we need to get rid of the hater crab and barrel mentality that I've seen with so many other black creators. And that's, you know, not like everybody's doing it, but I've seen it enough to know it's there. So uplifting each other, you know, finding ways... If somebody is on Twitter going, hey, I, I really want to make a game. I don't even know where to start. Answering that person out, mentorship. But the long and the short of it is money and resources. That's going to help people the most. Agreed. And 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 to that, uh, to some in some agree, there's a economic component that just can't be overstated, right? That mm -hmm. when, when you're asking somebody to make something, literally out of nothing right and then to your point even if you get to that point and somehow will it and that was something we spoke with mr golf about the idea of you're making making the impossible possible and then it's well we didn't think you were going to do that so now let us come in and change rearrange or commodify what you just did and, and really eventually exclude you out of your own space that, that again you have to kind of carve by hand and so that's again not to say that that's the the way of corporate spaces and again because gaming in its core and i don't want to get too far off of it it's supposed to be a space of inclusion right the idea of you sitting at a tabletop with friends and escaping the problems of the real world and rolling a d20 right the idea is like this is our break from all the other components of this or you and i picking up two controllers or logging in you know into a server and playing a game with two avatars that's supposed to erase all of these things, at least in the short term. But we've seen now, of course, the advent of gaming and gaming from those old hobby, those old hobby store days to again, where we can get these games at Target or go on a Kickstarter and raise millions of dollars. Now we found a lot of those same corporate, those corporate opportunities to say it nicely, creeping into the fandoms and spaces that were supposed to be safe spaces from it. Yeah, and you know the hard part is, and since you brought up Kickstarter, what I've realized and what I've seen is that people have gone from treating Kickstarter as a way of I've got this dope idea, this is my way to try to fund it, to treating it like a pre-order store, and that's not how it works because sometimes you try to fund something and it just doesn't work out, or things take longer, especially with the, you know, with the pandemic happening, shipping issues. And people really act like they're supposed to get two-day Amazon shipping when they do a Kickstarter or support one. Yep. Uh, I do think that narrative is there. And and having been on and consulted with and, and done several Kickstarters, I can, I can simply testify that that is much of the space now. And again, I think just like we talk about with gaming, I think there was a space of, of, uh, of innocence with, with this first component that, again, it was – Hey, I'm this person. I don't have the money for this, or we don't have the money for this, but wouldn't it be cool if? And I think there was an appreciation of the artistry it takes to make a game, right? So I think that's also something that we will, we can talk to in a moment is that it takes, it does take talent. This isn't just something that can be done, can be willed into it, whether that's the art on the box, whether it's the game, the design of the game, what in this mechanics makes this different or more unique than the other. And really, how does this play either as an individual or as a friend? That's long-term sustainable spaces. But I think now, and part of that has been that we've seen larger studios move into those crowdfunding spaces because mm -hmm. it is instant access to them, 
that, you know, I can make this game in six weeks. But to your point, um, it becomes more of a pre-order because there is no there's no story outside of we have a product and we'd love to get it to you. Now, mind you, I still throw my dollars at those two, but there's only a finite amount of resources that then if there's an independent studio, truly independent, that's relying on my time, my attention and my money to get that first idea off the ground. As you say, like, you know, they're trying to build their table, then it's easy to get overshadowed. And so I think that's mm -hmm. also a component that, I and mean, again, we can talk, this is the next step of where do we best find inclusive games? Where do we find spaces and, and, and not to use the word safe space, but I'm going to say it, safe spaces for us to build, appreciate and connect with each other. Do those exist in enough quantity and quality that we can name them or we can find a way to continue to support them? I think the spaces are there, but they're getting harder to find. And this is where, you know, I, I have a little bit of a moment about Twitter because I wouldn't be sitting here now if it were not for the community that was on Twitter at the time. I need diverse games be, became a hashtag that went viral and people saw it. You know, the power of Twitter at that point was still mostly for the good. But today, if you want to try to use Twitter, your tweets are probably being suppressed if you're not playing paying for Twitter blue, if you don't already have a check mark. And then if you do have a check mark because you were already paying for Twitter blue for those things, people may look at you funny because you got a check mark you basically paid for. Um, and the spaces are there and it's knowing where to look. But it's also, you know, and me, this is me being a pessimist, remembering that not all folk are kin folk and remembering that go into this with high hopes but not surprised if you if you're disappointed and that may sound a little bitter and and downy but every time it, it's kind of like a without fail every time that you think you this is it i found like the golden apple of of my people and games there's always that one person that messes it up for everybody uh, but I would say, you know, try to sounds Google. There's, you know, there's what you're doing. There's any diverse games. There's Black Girl Gamers. There's um, NNE Saga, which is over in the UK. There's um, POC in, in tech. Looking for Black people in games or Black game devs. And there's actually like a Black game devs group in the IGDA, which is the International Game Developer Association, where you are collaborating with people that are in the industry, hoping in the industry. And if you're a student, there's a student rate you can join before you officially got a job in the industry. Um, so looking up the special interest groups in IGDA, you know, following people on Twitter that are talking about this, do an advanced search. Granted, for as long as Twitter works, who knows how long, um, we're still secure enough to use, but Googling just groups or DEI groups, DEI groups in your country. Cause you know, we're, we're both in the U S there's a lot of people doing work globally about DEI and those conversations are going to look far different in a place like the UK or Japan or Costa Rica or somewhere that is not the U S. And I, th I think we also need to remember that DEI is not just race. It's about, accessibility, it's about disability, um, LGBT issues, and remembering that, again, if you know of a resource, go share it, because that's the, that's the hardest part, is that a lot of us don't share resources, and, you know, if you know somebody who's doing something dope, go share it, or if you just found, like, I found this cool list of Black game devs, let me go share it, it's it's those kinds of things. I, I think they exist, but I am of this is going to sound terrible, but I'm of the mind that no space is 100% safe. Whether that's because somebody finds it and infiltrates it, or you have that one hater that you have to root out. <laughs> um, but we should be able to have spaces. Like, I've got spaces that are just other Black people, and I have no shame in saying that, because at some days after you've been online enough, you need to just be with your people. Absolutely. And I don't think in saying your people in that sense, and, and we see it across most cultures, across most you know, gamuts and stripes of life, that there is an, an appreciation and a, uh, a disarming that can happen, you know, among among likes, you know, like minded, you know, like 
like culture or like experienced folks. So I think that is absolutely a, a necessary space to renew your energy to take on the rest of these spaces. And I think if anything, the the connected way that we in contemporary ways live, right? We all live online. You know, we have an online life, we have a in real world life, but the idea is that we have so many more avenues and access to us that again, we wear down so much easier than I think we used to. I mean, I can of course think to begin those good old fashioned tabletop days of it was just mm -hmm. pencil and paper and friends. But now yeah. my idea of gaming things is logging onto a server and spending all evening and afternoon, you know, trying to play a game and trying to also, you know, dodge bullets and dodge the N word at the same time. Right. And yeah. so yeah. that's, that's the part of that experience when we're talking about like the future of gameplay that has to now be attributed to it. Cause now, like you say, we have a global perspective of DEI, particularly in gaming because gaming's now launch and appreciate a global audience. And so again, you know, kind of outside of and in, in, in complement, but also in contrast to just having it being a, a racial component. I think it's a component where everyone's trying to bring all these communities together to experience their product, their, their experience, their game. And so in that, in bringing all these people together, we're bringing all of the social components of that. And because we see that most of the popular games, if we think you know, digitally like a Fortnite or tabletop like Dungeons and Dragons, their appeal is that we want to appeal to everyone. So when you appeal to everyone, you know, I think it is even more imperative, as you say, to bring in those experts to make sure that you're at least doing the due diligence up front, mm -hmm. not as a after effect or a compliment or a, a, a CYA for another faux pas issue that, that may come up. Yeah. And that, and that's the hard part because, you know, in a realistic world, you're not going to make everybody happy. There's going to be something you do and it could be even, you know, this is, is not a happy memory, but, and it's also why I got out of reviewing games and doing journalism. But when I talked about arms, that fighting game, that was the early games for the switch. And I talked about that, you know, like how the one brown character, her hair was a weapon instead of her arms, like everybody else. Some of the worst criticism I got was from other black people. Mm -hmm. So it's one of those things of, I don't know. And I feel like I'm being such a downer, but I'm also like a realist in that sense. So these are the things I've dealt with. I feel like we just need to... I'm trying to find the right way to say this. I feel like we need to uplift each other, but also um, understand that just because you're doing a thing and I'm doing a thing doesn't mean we have to do that thing together. Or if we can do that thing together, we have to make sure that everybody's having equity and having a good time with it, if that makes sense. I'm, I'm not wording well. I know what I'm trying to say. I don't think I'm just getting there. No, I, I get it. I think there's a, I think there's a space of accountability in between um you know bringing things together if if, mm -hmm. if if anything it is my mind is it's help but at the very least do no harm right if, if we yeah. don't complete or complement together then that doesn't give us you know an, an armistice or or worse you know to see each other's success um you know go you know go the natural progression as it should so I, that's what i take it as is the idea is again just because we're we are a people doesn't mean we can all we all are singular on one thing, right? We also want to respect the individuality and tastes and, and compliments of that. But the idea is to your point, so if we do and we all do come together, that we do need to make it a space, at, at the very least making it sustainable. And again, to your point of being able to make sure that there's an equitable stake that people they do the work and and are actually, you know, in that space as a career, I think also, you know, has to be taken in consideration because as you say, there's not enough of us in this space. We all acknowledge that. So what would, what kids, the biggest opportunities is building more of us versus saying that they're the Highlander friends, but there can only be one, right? We can only have one of us there and that person now has the onus to fix everything or nothing at the same time. Yeah. And it sucks being the only one, the Highlander. The, yeah. the rare one of us that is in a space. Um, but to be more positive, though, there are so many people doing 
great work in the space mm. um in video games like you know everything you're doing everything black girl gamers is doing um and 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 then e saga i'm never sure how to say it exactly but there are uk organizations so if you're in the uk there's there's a group there um and black girl gamers is the founders in the uk but she does have a very large american and outside the uk component um again the black game dev sig for igda so if you're in the international game developer association you should definitely uh join the black special interest group and then they have a gathering every year at gc um but also as low as i am to say it twitter's sometimes your best bet to find folks so also just don't be afraid to say hello and make real connections i mean that's how we got connected we just started chatting online um because that is everyone talks about networking i think actually making a real connection with somebody is going to get you a lot farther and it actually works because that's stronger than just i've networked my way to talking to you like mm. okay cool now what mm. do true do true and one of the thinking back uh, i want to give a shout out to africa comicade as as well as uh, xbox africa with a couple of spaces that likewise are you know on the continent doing uh, fine things not only just in traditional video games, but also in the tabletop spaces as well. And as you say, I think it is that we just, as as fans and as creators, we just have to do the due diligence of, of looking for those for those people and those projects and opportunities that we want to see and support. So mm -hmm. I think that's a great call out there for sure. Now, um, I want to open this up here in our, our last 10 minutes or so. Of course, that you know, if you have a comment or question, by all means, feel free to drop it in the chat. But I think in that good sense that Talking about the future of gameplay means that there are, you know, there are games in the present, whether tabletop or what have you, that we get a chance to enjoy. So I'd love to know, like, what are you playing now? Right. You know, the idea that you have a great access and purview. And again, sometimes, you know, well ahead of all the rest of us in, in these spaces. Um, you know, what are, what are you see. what are you vibing with right now? Uh, video game wise, uh, Baldur's Gate 3. Mm -hmm. It's early. It's early access. Um because I'm a big, you know, it's tied to D&D, &D, I'm a big D&D &D fan, but the latest patch gave us so much extra content, I'm having a blast kind of running through it. Um, Forspoken, um, you know, with the disclosure that I do know some of the people who worked on it. I'm finding it interesting because of all the complaints I've heard about it, about how Frey cusses too much, but yet we have games where the white bro cusses way more than she does. And I would think if I wound up in a strange world after people tried to burn down my house, I'd be cussing a lot too. So, um, you know, obviously there's D&D, &D, Rivals of Waterdeep, the show that I'm on. We're in our final and 15th season. Mm -hmm. And uh, I want to get back into, uh, I want to do some other things. I want to do some Dragon Age RPG and Vampire the Masquerade RPG. Um and I'm pretty excited for um, Wild Hearts because I got a chance to play that a little bit before release. It officially came out yesterday. And it's like, for me, it makes it makes me happy because it's a, a to me, a simplified version of, of Monster Hunter. And uh, my character looks super dope. So I got to have like good looking hair, brown skin and you know a hair that doesn't like steel wool so i loved it mm. that's awesome and, and isn't that like the that's what this should be right the guy of, of a game where you can see yourself and and be mm -hmm. appreciative whether or not in the fantastic sense or in, in the traditional sense that again you know you just all choose all the things that we think of, of game and gameplay which is mm -hmm. that interaction which is that appreciation and honestly relaxation like everything doesn't have to be um, you know, in that space where we're here to rally some type of political or social context to it, most times, I think for most of us, we just want to enjoy a game that is not so blindingly or is so blindingly devoid of any type of consideration for us that it distracts from it being a great game, right? And yeah. I think that, I think if that's really what the crux of this is in the future of gameplay is not that you have to cater to me, you just don't blatantly disrespect me in the idea of like where where the design the development the implementation the marketing and i'm hitting the table uh and all these other spaces that this had to go to and all the people that saw this and nobody said anything 
I think that's when it yeah. kind of gets to that point that, because as we said earlier, and as you allowed and you, and as you um, educated us, it takes so many people to make a game to get it to a market in a space that we as a consumer can enjoy it. So that means that all these people saw this and they still shipped it out and said, that's, this is okay. So I think that's the part where we're trying to say, you know, out of this for the future of gameplay, and I want to make sure to open it back up to you and our guests, um, that we absolutely do um, make a space that, you know, that consideration of the future of a gameplay is a consideration of players of all stripe and all types, you know, when, when the initial design document is created. Um, yeah. I mean, and, and that's the hard part because a lot of times, you know, that is a complaint we've all had mm -hmm. of how did it go from this to release and that realize that if there's no people of color, no black folks in the room, there's no one that's going to pick up on it. Or if you're that one black person in the room, do you speak up and risk maybe your job? You don't know. You never know how someone's going to react because I'm sure we've all gotten the, why are you so angry? Why are you so upset? And it's like, I'm not upset. I'm just trying to help you not look foolish. Mm. Um, and I, I did see our one question on the screen. Oh, yeah. I, I don't know what to tell you because me knowing a couple of writers does not mean I know anybody at Nintendo. Uh, I, I have zero context for that. And honestly, I don't know that I would want to see a Nintendo Switch port because the the requirements for it on pc i think would destroy a switch mm. honestly because i've got a pretty beefy machine and my machine gets really warm playing it i don't think it's a game that can port to switch easily the steam deck probably because mm. it's the steam deck and i'm playing it on pc but i think it would melt a switch as it is currently Oh, and we just want to continue to give a shout thank you so much for the, the answer there tanya we want to give a shout out to one of our our VIPs, uh, President Walsh over at Bennett College and um, and one of our historic HBCUs in Greensboro, North Carolina, and a, a lady of, of many talents and tastes. So obviously, you know, we'll, we'll figure it out together, Prez, I'm sure. So I look forward to it. And I thought the same thing about the Steam Deck, you know, to your point, you know, if that couldn't take it or could, I still have to go pick mine up. Um, I've had it on, on back order for a while, though. I think you can get them now. But um, yeah. Yeah, the idea is, um, you know, that that's good to know. Um, but I think that's also a component of, you know, where we're in a space where a, a Steam Deck can exist alongside of a Switch. You know, that again, kind of speaks back and kind of to bring us all home that, you know, we're looking at gameplay in every moment and aspects of it, right? The idea where we, our phones, and, and again, we're seeing the gamification of healthcare and all these other spaces that we're taking game principles now and trying mm -hmm. to bleed and implement that in other spaces. And so that's why I felt like having this conversation was so important on a lot of levels. But the idea of, of the way that we see games as a solution space seems that we still haven't added the equation in a lot of times of culture until it's too late. And so with that, you know, in your space of expertise, where do you see the future of gameplay in a, in a very large and broad sense or in some uh, particular space as far as we all need diverse games, right? We all need gameplay to also see us as diverse. Mm -hmm. So where does that synergy happen? Where we're looking at it from the black future perspective of, of where we can see gameplay really include us in a, an authentic space. Um, what I'm hoping is the future is that more of us are not just in the room because a lot of studios are actually inclusive and diverse in their staffing, but they're not at the C level. They're not at the people who are making those final decisions. We don't see a lot of black or people of color creative directors. We don't see a lot of women in charge of studios. We don't see, let alone black women who are in charge of anything, um, unless they did it themselves. So I, I think the future has to be not just us present, but us at the decision-making level and at a point where we can bring people up as well. Because you know if I can form a studio and bring people along, I'm going to have a better chance to bring other people into the fold and get them making their own games, making their own studios. than if I've got to go to a studio as an employee. So it's not just getting us in the door, but keeping us there um, and helping people, you know, improve their skills, things like that, having mentorship, but seeing more of us on stage at E3, 
seeing more of us giving talks at E3 and not just about diversity because we can talk about it. It's our lived experience, but I want to talk, I want to chop it at you about design, about, you know, mechanics and have us on stage at GDC talking about these things and not just how much it sucks to be brown in this space. Not to say we don't need the conversation, but you and I know, and some people watching, I'm sure know that that's the only time that we get tapped by these bigger events to talk and to give our perspective. It's come tell us once more about your pain versus the cool things you're doing. That's true. That's true. And um, and again, excellent points. You know, from from Player Prez, thank you so very much. And I couldn't agree more. I mean, it's just pretty much in sum that the appreciation and authenticity of our expertise, not only in the game place component, but I think as as you say, like in the the relationship of not of games as well as the culture that around gameplay has to be a, a 365 involvement, right? It can't be a, a special, you know, special opportunity. And to your point, where uh, we we see it as such, right? Or feel it as such, or really the recompense of, of whatever your actions are, you know, come to that same conclusion. Mm -hmm. And so that's where I think that that we have obviously the talent in the space, but and and just again, you said it so well. My, my part to that is just more of us here and more of us staying here in a professional space i think is is really that crux that we can work towards and that's why it's just it was just mission critical for us to bring you in here on black futures and really to talk about you know this purview that really just connects all of us the idea of games right the idea is that that is i'm for me you know again i'll, I'll close my ramble is that i just see gameplay just an integral part of the way that the world will, will interpret the world and the world interprets us. Uh, particularly, I mean, our young people are there, but I think, you know, we've always done this as just oh, as yeah. humans, right? You know, it's, you know, it's sticks and rocks. You know, we, we can be as, um, as basic as we want to in that sense of, you know, how do we entertain? We gotta think the human, as our human nature, that gameplay and gamification is a component. And if we don't find a way that we as, as black people are included in those equations and points, I think that becomes problematic. Um, not only just from the, the fun things that we're talking about video games, but then we're talking about things like machine learning that learn off games, right? Learn from gameplay and mm -hmm. same game mechanics. So then that's where now, and this is where I see it, that we just have to be in the space, but all that to say, yeah. you know, seeing you in this space has always been an inspiration. So I just want to say that to you, you know, here and now that we want to give you your flowers because I know that you do the work Thank and you've you. done it in a, a constant and consistent and professional basis. And I no, try. Just, no, you do well, you do more than well. So no, we appreciate you for that. But I think that's just kind of our, our space when we look at the black future of gameplay, that the idea is that we're still in the game, right? And that we had the chance to you know, be the rules of our own. And so, that's where I just feel empowered and just appreciative. And so I'm sure for our community, it's soon we just say thank you, you know, and appreciate oh, you being you. here. So we'll kind of close in some to say, how can we find you? How can we support you and and, and find the things to come? Um, so like I said, every, all of my um, all of my socials are Cypher of Tears, C-Y-P-H-E-R-O-F-T-Y-R. Um, that's where you can find me on Twitch, Twitter. And um, if you like D&D, I'm on Rivals of Waterdeep, which is twitch.tv slash Rivals Waterdeep. We're finishing up our 15th and final season. We're uh, going on five years of this show. We did um, fund our last season through crowdfunding because, well, Watsi said, no more money for you. So if you've got a Twitch sub or just want to throw us some funds to make this last season more epic, uh, you can find us on uh, twitch.tv Rivals Waterdeep or twitter.com Rival water deep because of did not fit and yeah and then i've got a patreon i've got coffee i've got twitch and i do way too much so if you find me online say hi say you read this talk and i'm glad for everybody who was hanging out thank you so much and and just want to give a shout out to our our, our mutual uh friend that does too much uh the lovely and talented tanya woods yes. uh, real bills likewise you know who is an integral part not only of this show but just a good human being all in some. So in, in that, we just want to say thank you to her as well. 
And again, just we appreciate you so very much. And I'm sure, you know, we'll have some time in our share for you to connect again. Well, thank you. And thanks for inviting me. I hope everybody has had a great day of programming. And uh, thanks to everybody in the chat who's been engaged and, and player press for asking questions. Oh, yeah. Player press is, is an awesome folks. Is, appreciate you. Thanks so much, Tanya. So, again, no y'all, uh, Tanya, the pass of I Need Diverse Games, of so many of the spaces and components of the game world and game development spaces that we get a chance to enjoy, sharing her vision of the future of gameplay. And so with that, we're going to set and... Oh yes, uh, let me just say yes. Tanya Woods is 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 a goddess, absolutely. So we want to again give flowers um, to um, to Madam Woods for sure. And so with that, I just want to just kind of conclude and and take a moment of uh, introspect of you know what we've had here, and let's see. Uh, I just want to make sure we have everything up and set because you know we're concluding year, day two here of the stream, but I want to make sure that we also uh, I want to share and just kind of take a moment to uh, bring and see if I can bring it to our stage, see if um, we may bring in our next part of our event, because even though the live stream is going to stop um, here in just a little bit, I want to make sure that we include you all in an amazing new component in space that we have here. Uh, let us see. I'm going to bring it to the back and see if I can can bring us in on this space. Um, it is spatial.io. And let me see if I can do it from my space here. Dot, dot, dot. It is not letting me. So I am going to, uh, we'll leave it back in the back end. <laughs> but in the idea of uh, we have a space with spatial.io. Uh, we have a new metaverse space that we've just trans um, transformed into a uh, new Wakanda space. You will be able to come and chat with a couple of hundred of us online in the space and place of uh, of our future vision. Um, I had to click present and then share tab. There we go. Let me see if I can uh, deal with that. Oh, I'll bother with that in a minute. I'll leave it as a, a drive in and for sure uh, we'll make those connections here. So. Let's see here. I'll kind of talk through it. So the idea is if you go to spatial.io, well, we have a great relationship there that we're forming the metaverse of inclusion um, with Harlem Film House, where most of the times and with Black Futures Month, we do want to look at the technological opportunities in front of us. And so what we'll do here is we have a complimentary space where either through your mobile phone or to the traditional PC, you can come in and vibe with about a couple of hundred of us as we'll look at art media and mediums and just be able to enjoy each other again trying to create inclusive spaces of course as we've done here with our black book fair here in atlanta georgia today but also want to find spaces in the metaverse that we can imbibe and appreciate black culture black experiences and build our legacies together so we want to make sure that you go to spatial.io as in the bottom right corner of the screen we'll leave this up and running here for about another 10 to 15 minutes as we go ahead and conclude the panel and this service, but from there, I'm just getting started. So also the um, space for day three is gonna be filled with uh, likewise, a lot of fantastic guests. So Player Prez has been a, a fantastic guest here again is President Walsh and who is the president of Bennett College will be our high noon guest uh, to speak about the future of HBCU. So we'll kind of get a great conversation to start off the day with a lot of the other um, earlier components of this show being about creativity, technology, and community that we'll bring into that noon conversation and can't wait to speak with her yet again. And then from there, we're going to have office hours. So from one to three, we're going to bring in three special panelists. Um, we're going to bring in uh, Joe Illich, who is of Milestone, DC, Heavy Metal, and several uh, publishing spaces. To come in where you can just for an hour bring in your questions uh, about how your particular and personal project can um, can be basically can learn from his time and talents and so just come in with your questions you'll joe and i'll be here you'll be able to ask him about his career about your own personal creative spaces that you want to see and how can he help you um, advance your career in the uh, digital and public media spaces then from there we have 
uh, LaShawn LaDawn Jones, who is an intellectual property lawyer. And so if you have questions about copyright, um, IP, or again, just legal spaces about your own creative work, um, we're going to have a pro bono hour for that. And then we'll conclude with Tonya Ransom of Blacklight Podcast. So for a lot of places and places, podcasting is a way to get your brand and your space exposed and, and be able to reach your audiences. And so we'll have a one hour session about starting your podcast in the most contemporary way um, with an award winning podcaster and fellow creative again, Tonya Ransom. So we'll have that information up here shortly or where you can follow and find those points. And then we will conclude um, a space and place of what is the future of subsume, right? So the idea is that we think, just like the sign behind me says, the future is here. Uh, we think that we can be a solution space for creative, technical, and creative, technical, creative, and community opportunities, uh, particularly in the Black diaspora of talent and be able to find a space and place that we all can be created. So we want to build the infrastructure, the conversation, and the expertise to be a space that everybody can find a positive and inclusive way to be a part of tomorrow. Uh, we honestly believe that tomorrow belongs to everybody. And so we want everybody to be a part and feel that authentically they can be themselves. And so we need your help. We need you to be the best version of yourself so that 